I moved here in January, so I'm here just one year. I'm a newbie, so to speak. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And um, anybody else want to say just why they came? Okay. We'll figure it out when you ask me all the questions that you always wanted to know, but never had the courage or the resources to ask. Hi, I'm Barbara. And we're going to wait a little bit longer. You see? Look at this. You have to wait at least till 11. At least, if not longer. Yeah, if you want to. We have three minutes to go, but I heard there was such a waiting list that I assumed we would be full. And I remember asking Kim, did any men sign up? Because I had a sense that men would be shyer about coming to this class. And she said, she started reading the names of all the men. Okay, now they're coming in. They don't want to come too soon. They don't want to sit up in the front. But yeah, we're going to start having a few men. Because we want the men's perspective, right? Not all about us women. Very good. Anybody else want to? Yes, did you want to say something? Well, this is going to be a challenge between your mask and my mask. Try again. Ruth Wertheim. Ruth Wertheim? Wertheim is something? No, wait, it's not Wertheim. Dr. Ruth. Dr. Ruth. Right. What did you want to say about Dr. Ruth? Yeah? Yeah. Well, I'm a child compared to Dr. Ruth because she's about 100. I'm only 84, so she's, but she's a wonderful person. She's a very little tiny lady with a wonderful education. I believe she came here from Germany and uh, she made a great contribution to the field of sex therapy. She started with the idea. I don't know if she started with the idea. Okay. Well, she certainly made a great contribution. And I think her contribution was not as much scientific as it was how to relate to people, how to talk to couples. That was her contribution, I think. She really had a Hamish, warm way of talking to people, and she put them at their ease. And so they were able to tell her what was troubling them. There were other contributions. I'm going to, I can do a piece on Masters and Johnson and what they contributed. And they were not warm and fuzzy people, but they were scientists. So we could talk a little bit about that. And we'll get to do, what do you think? Should we start or will it be distracting as people start coming in? Not at all. Let's go. First, I need a drink. <laughs> Start every class with a martini. <laughs> oh, very good. So somebody uh, asked a very good question. What am I here for and what am I going to talk about and this and that. And I'm going to remind you what you signed up for. Okay, this is what you signed up for. Barbara Anderson, a licensed psychotherapist and sex therapist has volunteered to teach a lighthearted, though informative class on sex. She will, <laughs> well, that was an appreciative comment. <laughs> she will answer all your questions. But having taught this class many times, she, know you, she knows you will be shy and reticent, and you'll only refer to issues that affect your crazy uncle or your sister-in-law, never about yourself, of course. So I came prepared with lots of questions. And these are questions that have come to me over the years, posed by paying customers during my 50-year career. If there's a good response, the class can be continued, or we can repeat it for people who didn't get to be here. So, a little, little bit about myself, me, me, me. Uh, I trained as a social worker. I worked at Jewish Family Service, the very Jewish Family Service that's here. But I worked here from 1970 
1980, a long time ago. We began in Camden, New Jersey, and then we migrated to Cherry Hill. Um, while I was at Jewish Family Service, the University of Pennsylvania was offering a class, a course, in sex therapy. It was very new then. It was just 1972, 73. Very new. Uh, uh, Masters and Johnson had completed a lot of their work, and uh, they were eager to disseminate their work. And Dr. Siegel, who was the director, sent me to go and take this course. And it lit my fire, so to speak, okay? Pardon me? Did you hear about Eric Armstrong? No, I didn't. She's in Florida. She's in Florida. Well, how could I not know her? What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> All right. So anyway, I took the course. I loved it. I decided that I'm going to private practice, and I went to took more courses, and I became a sex therapist in addition to being a psychotherapist. Um, in 1984, I got my PhD. I started my PhD program in human sexuality, and I completed that in 1987. So I think you could say I know a lot about sex. Okay? Book learning only, of course. <laughs> um, Steve and I moved from Hattonfield to San Francisco in 1993, and there I got a wonderful job. I was head of the mental health services for transgender people. Wow. So I can tell you a lot about the transgender experience, whatever you have questions about. So, everybody's in the right class, right? This is not musical chairs or any other class, all right? So, I'm gonna run through a whole bunch of subjects that I can talk to you about. And let's see what lights your fire. And if nobody's fire gets lit, I'll just talk about what I think is important, what a sex therapist does and what kind of problems come to a sex therapist. But here are some of the subjects. What's a fetish? Is that sick? All questions about transgender, transvestite, cross-dressing, can women be transgendered? What's the surgery for transgender people? How long can you have sex? Well, that's a terrific question. Do you mean at one time? Or how long in the lifespan can you have sex? So I have to ask people because they're very concerned about how long to have sex and how many other people have sex without long and all of that. Okay. What's a normal amount of sex? For couples to have. What's the definition of a sex maniac? What's a sex maniac? Anyone who wants to do something you don't want to do, that's a sex maniac. Okay, you're supposed to laugh now, folks. Uh, how about a more s a serious subject, infidelity? Can a person who's been unfaithful ever be trusted again? Very important question. Aphrodisiacs. Are there foods we should eat, foods we shouldn't eat, and what should we be prepared for? Dating. My granddaughter meets men online. Is that dangerous? How can older people meet a partner? Anyway, there's loads and loads of questions. I'm going to open it to the floor. If people are still shy, I will just talk about what I think is interesting. But does anybody have a question they would really like me to address? Oh, not one person. Not, come on, Rena, I knew you would. Rena is a colleague of mine. She was a social worker at Jewish Family Service in Philadelphia, and she was their sex expert. Go ahead. Uh, what sex should be like at, at different ages as you, as you get older? How it changes. Okay, I'm going to try and restate that. What should sex be like? How does it change? Well, as you get older. As you get older, which we're all doing right. Well, I don't know, probably your style of cooking changes, the clothes you wear change as you get older, and our bodies, God forbid, 
what whatever is left of us is changing. So of course the way our bodies function changes, our relationships change with our partners. Sometimes our partners change, you know? We, we turn one in for another one, so we have different changes. I think that question is so individual. There are people who say their sex life is as good today as it was when they met when they were 25. Of course, I don't ask them, how good was it when you were 25, you know? It might not have been so wonderful then either. But you have to adapt. You have to adapt to sensitivity. You have to adapt to physical disability. Uh, sex is a huge subject. By sex, I mean anything that has to do with expressing physical love, uh, touching, kissing, hugging, sweet words. All of that includes, that, and including that in sex. And you might say, ah, that's cool, and we know what real sex is. But I, I'm not going to limit this talk to that. So Rena, thank you for the question. It's probably not a great answer. If you were a client and you said to me, what should good sex be? Uh, or how should sex change? I would ask a person about their life. And how was it when they were young? And how do they wish it would be? And how can they get from where they are to a better place? OK, another question. Rena, she's not going to give up. I just want to keep continuing with that. Yes. When I would see an older couple, mm -hmm. and they would tell me about what was going on with them sexually, and I was able to tell them, well, that's the way it is. That's the way it's normal. That's good at yes. your age. If okay. you're lucky, yes. uh, it helps a lot of people just okay. to know that. I want to repeat what you said. So when Rena would see an older couple, and they would describe what their sex life was like, and even if they had a little complaint, she would say, but you're lucky. That's good. It's good to feel that way. It's good to try this or do this. Or compensate. Some of you have to compensate. What gets lost, you have to find something else. OK, anything else? Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to leave. No, <laughs> not leave. Well, a very common complaint or concern The whole area of sexual desire, I would say that's one of the commonest complaints that people had, is that either they had lost desire for sex, or they had a different level of desire for sex than their partner, or they had a different interest in sexual activities than their partner. First, when they complain, I say, let's make sure we're talking about sex. Maybe the person needs reassurance or physical closeness or expressions of love. When they say, well, he needs sex, I tell them nobody needs sex. People do need reassurance and caring and love, but people want sex. Or they don't. Uh, from talking to men and women, and yes, I have met as many men who have issues with sexual desire as women. So that may surprise people. The kind of the stereotype is the woman never wants to do it. She always has a headache. And the man is just, you know, a roaring bull. But I have had a number of couples who come in with the opposite complaint, that uh, their partners are not as interested in sex as they are. And that causes a lot of strife. Not only is one person or both people's needs not getting met, they're fighting about this. So I separate this very artificial, but I have good reasons for not wanting sex and bad reasons for not wanting sex. And at the end, I'll tell you why I title them good and bad. Here are some good reasons for having low sexual desire. It hurts. It's boring. It takes too long, or it doesn't last long enough. There's a lack of emotional connection. I'm too tired, sick, unhappy. It's difficult to focus, difficult to keep my mind on it. The habit, the, uh, habit of multitasking, everybody familiar with this new thing that everybody multitasks? 
God forbid you should be doing only one thing if you're taking a walk after you're listening to your music or something like that. You have to, uh, as you're cooking, you're also doing something on the telephone, okay? Uh, so one person, one scientist suggests that people have uh, become dependent on being very stimulated with more than one thing. So they can't just sit and think about something, and nor can they just uh, concentrate on having sex, just focus on having sex. Uh, an example is, maybe I can prepare the shopping list while I'm getting aroused, you know. Until I get aroused, I'll just think of something else. Well, you know how good an idea that is. Other good reasons, and I'll explain later why it's so good. Lack of privacy. You know how many people, they have a mother-in-law living with them, they have six children living with them, they maybe are staying with friends and family, maybe they become homeless because of the situation uh, that we're all dealing with. Sometimes they don't like their partner's odor, touch, or choice of sexual activity. I mean, that'll turn you off, right? Fear of criticism. I don't want to be told that I don't do it right or I don't, my timing isn't up to your timing or something like that. And the last one is, well, he's a morning person, and I'm a nighttime person, blah, blah, blah. So that's, those are all the good reasons to have sex.